Thank you, Mary. I'm glad and honored to represent the Cincinnati School Board, both the present one and the past one. And to have the opportunity, as described in the job description for me tonight, to try to put the local Cincinnati story in some kind of historical, national perspective. In Cincinnati, and I think everywhere, from start to finish, it's about community. Here in Cincinnati, our community learning centers, CLCs, or community schools, were envisioned by community leaders, sponsored by community partners, and embraced by community members. In fact, uh, most remarkably, as Mary mentioned, here in conservative Cincinnati, the promise of a yet unseen CLC inspired the community to pass a billion dollar bond levy, of which 80% would be local dollars. This public promise to rebuild our district around the concept of CLCs was made when the district was shrinking, public trust was waning, achievement declining, and most alumni couldn't recognize their alma maters, or worse, see themselves among their alma maters current enrollees. And you all know what I mean by that. So what made this leap of faith possible? It's always been about community. In fact, here in the Midwest, you heard I was a history teacher, or I should say here in what was once the Northwest Ordinance Territory, the public school has been, by design, literally the center of the community. In 1787, the U.S. Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance, which guaranteed that there be one square mile in each township for the purpose of building a school, quote, so that education forever be encouraged. Furthermore, by design, those 18th century community members even pledged that a certain percentage of all the sales proceeds in the territory, quote, shall fund our schools so that each child attends schools that were locally controlled for the benefit of the community and for the preservation of our republic. Those are big ideas. So our schools here in Greater Cincinnati have always been everyone's responsibility. We may not always have known what to call them or name them, but CLCs are in our DNA. They are our history and our chosen future. Schools as CLCs have reawakened that heritage for us. They've helped revitalize our district and we think may have even helped spur the renaissance that is occurring in many of our 56 neighborhoods. What's old is new again. That usually happens when you have a good idea. The early history may help tell the Cincinnati story, but more contemporary events nationally may better explain the growing American interest in the community school movement and the ever-increasing sense of urgency regarding their implementation, particularly in urban districts. Consider for a moment a timeline that begins with white flight and middle-class desertion from urban to suburban America. Remember particularly the 70s and the 80s when the abandonment became so apparent in most urban classrooms. Recall the resulting loss to the urban school districts of both tax base as well as the loss of engaged tax-paying community members who were experienced and comfortable enough and used to influencing and even determining how their schools would work. 
As you all know, poverty's real cost to the urban school districts is not the loss of student aptitude or IQ, absolutely not that, but rather it's the loss of empowered citizens experienced in demanding positive outcomes for their public schools. It's not about the kids. It is about power and how to exercise and make demands. It's no wonder that as the urbans declined, the suburban districts flourished. Again, it's not because of the nature of our students in either setting, but the residency of demanding grown-ups, some experienced in exercising powers and others not. Without the perpetual civic advocacy and diminished public support, the urban systems lowered expectations, depleted resources, and a vacuum of power was filled by educational insiders and experts. Yes, unions, administrators, and other educators gained an imbalance of power and frankly had to carry on the best they could. They had to hold the fort down as a concerted effort to dismantle and discredit public education commenced. Thank you for holding the fort. When the public's voice is no longer heard, the politicians' rantings grow louder, and the schools become less reflective of the people's vision and more the product of partisan platforms. Do you really think parents would have invented No Child Left Behind? or become dependent upon standardized tests for their children, or reduce recess, or cut art and music so that there's more time for remediation? Of course not. Do you really think empowered communities would want their children to sacrifice science and social studies in order to score a few more points on high stakes tests mandated for political reasons and not so, quote, so that education is forever encouraged. We've become small-minded. How do we know that they wouldn't have done that? We know that in Cincinnati because our community schools are the example of the public taking back their schools. The public, not the experts, created community schools. Just as it was in 1787, citizens, be they parents or not, are retaking responsibility and ownership for our most American institution, our public schools. We know that children learn where they live and their ability is not only a product of birth and family, but also a product of the richness of their surroundings. A child's future, particularly an impoverished child, is greatly destined by the commitment of complete strangers. Think about that. We are so proud in Cincinnati regarding our facilities master plan in part because no child in Cincinnati attends a school that is not either refurbished, retooled, or brand new. Our children know that their neighbors care about them and have invested in them and in their future. Our CLCs are a testament to the commitment of strangers and neighbors. We know in Cincinnati that the opportunity gap is as important as the achievement gap. And its size, the size of the opportunity gap, can be as devastating an impact on both children of wealth and children of poverty because it makes it impossible to have full inclusion. Or as America's only true education president said, Lyndon Johnson, of course, former teacher in a bilingual school, in rural Texas, as he started. We don't think of that, of, of him that way, but he said, 
It's not enough to open the gates of opportunity. All of our citizens must have the ability to walk through those gates. That's what public schools mean and what they need to do. That's what public schools that become CLCs offer to both the communities of wealth and poverty. The fullest inclusion of each for the benefit of all. For that promise of opportunity, that hope of success, the community and school relationship must be made seamless. Therefore, keep community in community schools. Keep the public in control of public schools. And thank you all for one particular thing. Besides all your love, service, and devotion, be aware that you are the vanguard that will make this republic stronger, safer, better, but more particularly, will forever encourage education. Thank you very much.